Having worked in retail and commercial lending for over 10 years, I got a pretty rare view into the money habits of thousands of individuals. And coupled with being a money conscious and frugal individual myself, I've been able to identify certain patterns that keep people trapped in the middle class rat race. Now the middle class can be comfortable, but it's also where one can work really hard and not really get the sense that they're moving forward you may not even have the ability to picture a better future. For those that want more for themselves and their children and want to reduce their risk of slipping down the socioeconomic ladder, here is a list of the most common traps that keep you in the middle class rat race. Number one, not having savings to weather emergencies. Not having savings to cover a sudden financial emergency not only puts you in a bind at the time of the emergency, but can also set you down a path of financial decline that can be difficult to recover from. Let's say your car breaks down and you need your car for work and you're looking at a $2,000 repair bill. You put it on your credit card and now you only make the minimum payments so you have to pay the extortionate credit card interest on this balance. If you live paycheck to paycheck, you may never be able to pay this balance down. And this is just one emergency. Imagine if you faced a number of emergencies around the same period. Car breaks down, need a new phone, or you have to move to a new place and the rent is $500 more per month. Each of these things alone is not enough to destroy you, but a confluence of emergencies could make it game over for you. Number two, not having life or health insurance. Now I'll come right out and say it, life insurance is pretty much useless for anyone who does not have dependents. If you do not have dependents, you're better off taking the amount of money you'd pay in premiums and investing that and keeping the money for yourself. And yeah, the payout is huge if you pass away early, but you'd be dead and you really wouldn't be able to use that money anyways. Now, if you have dependents, for example, children or a spouse who's not working or aging parents, then life insurance is going to be incredibly useful and is something you should consider. Even if your spouse is working, if you are the main earner and you bring home a disproportionate amount of the income, then life insurance will help you as well. Life insurance can help your surviving family maintain the options that are available to them. Your kids don't have to give up college just because you passed away and your spouse doesn't have to pick up and move to a cheaper part of town because you have to sell your family home. This will not only preserve your wealth, but help your surviving family not slip down the socioeconomic ladder. Now, health insurance can be useful even if you are single. Health insurance is not unlike an emergency fund, but the payout will often be much larger than the amount you could have possibly saved up, depending on your plan. So paying small premiums regularly is a good alternative to saving up a lot of cash and have it sit as cash and not really be invested just in case you have an unpredictable health emergency. Number three, buying new cars every few years. Now you knew this was coming. Cars are incredibly effective at destroying wealth. First, depending on where you live, you may have to pay a significant tax on the price of the vehicle, which really buys you no actual value. Where I live, a $50,000 car would cost you $56,500 because of taxes. Now, if you finance the vehicle, the price of the car will be inflated. So let's go back to a $50,000 example. The $50,000 car, you will be paying $55,000 for it as an example. And why is that? Well, the extra $5,000 will be a padding that will be put into the price of the vehicle that you're gonna be financing simply so individuals all along the chain, such as dealers, brokers, salespeople can get their cut. Everyone needs to wet their beak. To let me wet my beak a little bit. Wet your beak? Wet my beak, son. Okay, so your $50,000 vehicle is now $55,000, and after taxes, that's going to be, let's say, $62,000 where I live. Now, most people don't object to this padding because it's something that's amortized over the life of the loan, and they really don't feel it as immediately as they would if they paid, let's say, this $5,000 upfront in cash. Next, and I'm sure you've heard of this before, the value of the vehicle will drop 10 to 20% as soon as you drive it off the lot. And it is true. So right away, your $50,000 car will be worth $45,000. 
and you just paid $62,000 for it because of that padding and because of taxes. So you're looking at an instant $17,000 of wealth destruction within a matter of hours. Now, if you're gonna finance the vehicle and the total amount you're financing is $62,000, you're probably gonna end up paying around seven dollars to $8,000 of interest over a 60 month period. And that is not all. Once you've purchased your car, the car will continue to lose value through depreciation. As a rule of thumb, cars generally lose about 50% of their value every five years. It's not true for all vehicles, but very generally, it tends to hold true. So the $50,000 car will be worth $25,000 in five years, losing you $5,000 a year or about $400 a month. And you're not out of the woods yet. If you buy a luxury vehicle or a sporty vehicle or even a semi-luxury vehicle, you may have to buy premium gas for it, which is going to cost you significantly more and all your maintenance is going to be more expensive as well. Now imagine doing this every five years, sinking a large amount of cash or dedicating a large amount of your cash flow into an investment with a guaranteed negative return. And you can see how this is going to be an incredibly strong headwind to wealth creation, not only in terms of direct costs, but also in terms of the opportunity costs. Number four, using home equity for consumption. Most people aren't great savers, but for those who have managed to purchase a home, they will often see one big windfall in their lives, and that is the home equity from a refinance. After years of paying down their mortgage and years of home price appreciation, they may have a large amount of equity in their home that they can access through a refinance. This amount can be substantial, anywhere from a few tens of thousands of dollars to upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And as soon as people get their hands on this money, they generally tend to do some pretty dumb shit with it. Not unlike lottery winners, they go out and buy new cars and fancy clothes and vacations. And here's something I see a lot of people do with their home equity money. They will go and remodel their kitchen or renovate their washroom or something like that. Now, oftentimes these renovations will be incredibly expensive and unnecessary and primarily for aesthetic reasons only. Now, I don't have anything against going out and spending some of the home equity money to make necessary repairs to the house, redo your roof or your driveway, but unnecessary, expensive and aesthetic renovations are a waste of money. Now, people might say, wait a minute, uh, I just renovated my kitchen and that increases the value of my home, so that shouldn't be a bad thing, right? But you see, you just redid your kitchen, not to sell the home, but to use it. And here is where the problem is. You basically did the equivalent of moving into a more expensive place and are paying more rent. You might not feel like that, but if you spend $30,000 on a new kitchen, you only see the return on that investment if you sell your home. If you use it, it's consumption. You know, I worked with a nice lady once and she was a colleague and she was working in the admin department and she was in her 50s. And she'd tell me all these stories about how people did business back in the day in the 80s and 90s, how she would have to type up all the contracts using typewriters and how people could freely drink and smoke in the offices. And I found those stories very interesting. And she told me the story about when she moved into her first house that she purchased and she purchased it for $200,000. And then she told me that she had sold that house a few years after and moved into a nicer place. And I remarked that she had made a decent bit of profit. And she said, you know what? Uh, yeah, it sounds like a lot of money, but after redoing your kitchen and redoing your floors and the new place was much bigger, so we had to get new furniture in there. And after doing all of that, there wasn't really a lot of money left. Now, at the time when I was speaking to her, her husband was unfortunately laid off due to a health condition. She was a sole earner and she wasn't making more than let's say $50,000 a year. And this lady would constantly complain about her job and about the stress she faced in her job and the pressures and talk about quitting frequently. And I didn't say anything, but I was looking at her and thinking, you know, if she could have simply lived without a nicer floor and a nicer kitchen for a few more years, she probably could have retired by now. And what's shocking is that what she did is really the norm. That's what people do. People go into a bigger place and renovate it and buy more furniture and really blow through a lot of their equity that they could get from 
a sale of a house. Number five, blowing their bonus. Similar to home equity, the only other time a lot of people living paycheck to paycheck see a large chunk of money deposited into their account is when they get their annual bonus. The Japanese custom, that's why they see my bonus. <laughs> bonus! <laughs> that's good! <laughs> now I understand that not all jobs have a bonus, but many do. And for most people, their first temptation is to spend the bonus. A bonus of 5 to 10% of someone's annual salary is enough to spend on vacations, gadgets, and other luxuries. If you live paycheck to paycheck, save your bonus. It's also a very good way of quickly building up your emergency fund. Number six, not focusing on building new skills and taking on new opportunities. I see a lot of people waiting around in their current role for years, hoping to get a paltry raise or fighting tooth and nail to get a promotion. If you do this, you're leaving money on the table. Your pay will often not keep up with your gain in experience and knowledge, and moving jobs will generally result in a significant raise. Furthermore, when you're moving into a new role, you can, shall we say, emphasize certain skills and attributes of your resume that may be more valuable to employers and are compensated more highly. You should always be looking out for new opportunities. And if you love your job, but not the pay, getting another offer could help you negotiate a much larger raise with your current employer. Switching jobs can also jolt you out of your comfort zone and help you learn new skills and stay abreast of industry knowledge. Number seven, spending too much on kids. Now I'm not here to talk about whether you should have kids or not. That's gonna be a very personal choice and that's going to depend on you and your circumstances, but there's no getting around it. Kids are expensive. Financially speaking, the best thing you can do besides not having kids or having fewer kids is spending less on them. Now I'm not talking about spending less by giving them less food. Please sir, I want some more. What? or substandard education. No, not at all. What I am talking about is the material stuff that people buy for their kids. I'm always astonished when I see people take their toddlers on vacation. Your kids are not going to remember that vacation, so don't waste your money, and you'll probably have a better time there without your kids. You could probably pay a fraction of the amount you would have paid to take your kids on vacation to a trusted friend or a family member to watch your kids while you are away. Also to young children, a beach an hour away is probably the same for them as a beach in the Caribbean. They're not exactly the most discriminating of individuals. When your kids are young, expensive clothes and expensive toys are also a waste of money. Kids grow up fast and they also lose interest and change interest very quickly. So spending a lot of money on such things is really gonna give you very low ROI. Now I'm not a parenting expert, but I will recommend that you give your children more time to play with physical objects before they get sucked in to that black hole of social media and video games and screens. Number eight, not staying healthy. Ignoring your health can directly and negatively impact your wealth. Not only will medical costs eat away at your health, but a serious issue can take you out of the workforce for a long period of time, if not permanently, especially if you do manual work. Carpal tunnel, slip disc, tearing your ACL, all can incapacitate you. It's tempting to grab burgers or pop in a frozen dinner in the microwave after a long day, but it will take a toll on you. Planning meals ahead of time on your days off might seem daunting, but gets much easier once you get the hang of it, just like any other habit or skill. The second part of the equation is working out. Whether it's going for a run or lifting weights, you have to do either one or a combination of both at least twice a week with sincere effort. If you have decent weather where you live, going for a walk for 40 minutes after your dinner four times a week will go a long way to improving your health compared to if you had done nothing. Get a scale. Use it regularly to monitor your weight. Maintain a good BMI. If your BMI is over 25, you need to make hunger a familiar feeling. Your habits are not only for you. Your children will take cues from you about how you live and eat and exercise, and it will inform their views. So don't do it just for you, do it for your children. Number nine, not teaching your children about money. Speaking of children taking cues from their parents, it is not only important 
to be good with money, but also teach those good habits to your kids. Do not deprive them, but do not spoil them either. Have them earn what they want. Teach them to value the possibilities and options and freedom that money offers rather than material things that money can buy. Number 10, marrying poorly. Now I understand divorces happen, people grow apart, people change, times change, circumstances change. Now what you can do is to ensure that your wealth is protected in the event of a divorce. The best way to do this is through assortative mating. This is a fancy term for marrying an individual of a similar socioeconomic status. That is his good friend, Mr. Darcy. <gasps> it's miserable, poor soul. Miserable he may be, but poor he most certainly is not. There is a biological definition for assortative mating, but for this discussion, I'm going to rely purely on the socioeconomic definition. In the event of a divorce, two things will destroy wealth cash flows and net worth. This depends heavily on what jurisdictions you're in, so I won't go deep into the specifics, but please educate yourself on relevant laws that apply to you vis-a-vis -vis divorce based on where you live. If you marry someone with a similar net worth to you, then chances are you will not have to pay the other party a significant amount of money in the event of a divorce. The second piece is cash flow, that is to say spousal and child support. Same principle here. If your spouse earns as much as you, then you won't need to pay much spousal or child support as the child support is generally paid by both parents in proportion to their respective incomes. Once again, very important disclaimer, the specifics of how this works will depend on the laws that are in effect in your jurisdiction. So please read up on what will apply to you. While you may not have full control over whether you get divorced or not, you do have great control over how much money you're set to lose in the event of a divorce. Number 11, not building generational wealth. A lot of people do not think about building wealth beyond their own lives, and this is just fine if you decide to remain childless. But in a world where social mobility is declining, assuming you love your children and you want them to do well, you probably want to think about building some generational wealth. The term generational wealth might conjure up images of palatial mansions, countryside manors, fox hunts, diamond cars, to golden showers. But creating generational wealth can be very simple and low key. Passing on a paid off home to your children can pass on generational wealth. Or provided you haven't spent your home equity on consumption, you can help your children with their own down payment using part of your own accumulated equity while you're still alive. If you gave your grandchild $25,000 when the child is born and invested that $25,000 on their behalf in the S&P passively, then that amount would be $400,000 by the time that child is in his or her early 40s, inflation adjusted. That can go a long way towards helping them make a down payment on a house or helping them build even more generational wealth. By the time that grandchild is 65 years old, that $25,000 would have turned into a million dollars inflation adjusted. Of course, this is all for nothing if you do not teach your children responsible financial behavior. Declining social mobility should be a big concern if you have children, as there has never been a worse time to be not well off. Now, if you're looking to get started building your wealth, here is a video you'll probably be interested in. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Cheers. A better future. Like a drowning man, all you're doing is thrashing your arms wildly to keep your head above water and not be consumed by the sea of oblivion.